I would like to have Jorge Angel come up and lead our meditation. Thank you, Susan. Please, please close your eyes. Relax. Relax your bodies. Load your shoulders. Relax your face. Concentrate in the center of your forehead between your eyebrows. Look with your inner eye. Look inside. Remember, kingdom of heaven is within you. The Lord himself resides in your body. You are the temple of the living God. All happiness is inside of you. Feel that happiness. Breathe that happiness. Embrace that happiness. Let it be part of you. All peace is inside of you. Feel that peace. Embrace that peace. All the contentment that you are looking for is inside of you. Thank the Lord for everything that you enjoy. Thank the Lord for the gift of life. Enjoy your life. Enjoy your companions. Enjoy your family. Thank the Lord for what you are. Because you, you are the most important creature on earth. Because you were made in his own image. Thank the Lord for everything because you, you are divine. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. And now for our guest speaker today, Patsy Krakow. She's going to talk to us about what new brain scan technology is revealing about the subconscious mind and the latest information on how our older brains, oh, don't you just hate that word, <laughs> differ as we age. Please welcome Patsy Krakow.
this forward. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> A little too much. No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, it does reverberate. I don't know that anything can be done about that. Um, thank you for being here. Really, I'm amazed, as always, at all the wonderfully interesting people. We got to hear from some that are new today, and some I, of you I know. But it's amazing the different places that people have been and have lived and who all come here from different walks of life, having had different experiences, and yet open to learning new things. And I really appreciate that. I, um, I'm a psychologist, or at least I was. I think I still am. <laughs> Uh, originally, I was trained as a journalist. I went to school on journalism scholarships, and life does what it usually does. I ended up working in other occupations and became a psychologist later on in life. And currently, I work on the internet. I'm somewhat of a blogging buff and internet marketing specialist. It's What I do today is writing for other people and content marketing. And I have a, this passion for the brain. And especially right now, this is very exciting because they're learning more and more about the brain every day. A book I read two years ago is already out of date. Not that the information is out of date, but they've discovered so much more during the last two years. And so six months ago I presented and then I was preparing something, actually a presentation uh, in Holland on marketing and there was so much stuff about the brain that they're doing in marketing that I called Jim and I said I've got to present again there's new stuff that we as not older but aging you know maybe getting a little older people need to know about so <laughs> I don't know and so I'm going to ask you questions as I go along and I'm going to ask the volunteers to pass around the microphones so I can hear from you too because my world is in books and in research but I need to know how real people are experiencing these things. Uh, are you all familiar with the serenity prayer? Right, show of hand. Okay, maybe I have but let me just recite it because I think it's applicable to growing older. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change and the, have the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And that's, that's really important in life. And for this topic, I want to introduce to you another prayer, the senility prayer. <laughs> God, grant me the senility to forget the people I never liked anyway. <laughs> The good fortune to run into those that I do, and the eyesight to tell the difference. <laughs> so with that, if you have questions or want to get in touch with me afterwards, just go on the web to writingontheweb.com. That's my blog. And leave a comment or email me if you have my email. Um, I am Dr. Patsy Krakoff psychologist, journalist, internet, blogging buff. And as I grow older, I'm much more passionate about finding ways to live better, to live longer, but to live healthier and happier. And I, I'm sure you are too. But particularly because in my family, most people died in their 40s and 50s, either from alcoholism, cancer, or stroke. I, I had two aunts. Aunt Clara and Aunt Leone, who lived rather long. They lived into their 80s. And I often wondered why. What were they doing differently? All of my uncles and my own mother drank too much and had early deaths due to alcoholism. My father drank too much, probably wasn't an official alcoholic, but he died after strokes and brain cancer. Now, my sister didn't drink at all, but she died in her 50s from kidney cancer. Now, I have two nephews in my family left. They're in their 20s, and they're doing just fine. They drink too much, in my opinion, <laughs> but then again, they're in their 20s. So 
So when I see some of my friends that are caring for their parents in their 90s, and in some cases beyond, I'm really impressed that they're still living. And yet too many of aging parents are suffering from diseases of the brain. Now I remember an uncle dying from a heart attack in his 40s. And many of the men that I know, including some here, including my own husband, have had heart attacks. But they're living and they're doing just fine today. So my hope is that in a few years, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, and dementia will be a thing of the past. And that even though those things may still exist, we won't be showing the signs and symptoms that are so devastating. Like the nun, Sister Bernadette, very famous in neuroscience uh, literature. She was quite elderly, did great. She taught school. She finally died in her 80s. And when they did, they did an when she did die, they did an autopsy. And what they found was her brain actually was riddled with plaque, and she had severe Alzheimer's disease. She showed no symptoms at all. She was fully functioning. How is that possible? In another case, there was an expert uh, chess player who was well known, very intelligent, and he could remember, I don't know, up to seven moves ahead. He could hold that in his memory. He came in for testing because he said, there's something wrong with my brain. I can only remember four moves ahead. Well, they couldn't really figure out much, but he finally died of other causes. And they did an autopsy, and he too had Alzheimer's. However, he was fully functioning. So the question is, since then they've done a lot of studies in uh, retirement homes of elder people, and when they die, uh, they've shown also that it is possible to have Alzheimer's and to show no signs or symptoms. We don't really know why yet. But they're studying on it, and they're working on it, and they have a couple of clues that I'm going to reveal to you today. They call these people escapees, because they've escaped the devastating uh, results of these brain diseases. So what they're discovering is really fascinating, and I believe there's clues for all of us, even for those of us that don't have a disease or, or dysfunctioning. The thing is that we have to pay attention to what those things are and start working on them today because it's, everything is a cumulative effect. So if you're learning and educating yourself and engaging in activities that challenge your brain, engaging in physical activity, eating a good diet and all those things, those are going to help stave off the signs and symptoms if you do have Alzheimer's and it would also uh, create new brain cells and prevent severe loss and disease. So I want to ask you a, a question, a uh, show of hands. How many of you have had experience in your families with an aging person who's had dementia or Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's about at least half. And you know how devastating that could be. There are many mysteries to the brain and why some people age well and others don't. Fortunately, we are learning several key things that our parents' doctors didn't know, and they're beginning to realize that there are things that can be done. My own family history is the reason I'm so passionate about this and about staying healthy. And, and maybe I'm a little paranoid, too, because uh, <laughs> I, I, my own history of drugs and alcohol has meant that I, th I think sometimes Maybe I've done some serious permanent damage. I haven't had a drink or a drug in 25 years, but each year I notice little changes and I wonder. And I'm sure some of you do too. In fact, I'd like to ask you a show of hands. How many of you have experienced some sort of change in what you think might be brain-related behaviors, whether it's memory or moods or something else? Depression. <laughs> yeah, we're just starting, and depending on what age you are, you may be in your 50s, still 60s, or 70s, or 80s, and these vary as we grow older. So there's two reasons I want you to pay attention today. One, that we're experiencing changes, 
and we need to know what's normal and what really merits a visit to the doctor. And the other thing is, we now know we can do several things to lower the chances of getting Alzheimer's disease and dementia. <coughs> And the thing is, there's a lot of misconceptions. You know, the film that came out, Grumpy Old Men. You know, uh, nothing really could be further from what the research is showing. We are grumpy old seniors. As we get older, we have a more positive outlook. They didn't know that several years ago. We now know that. So while we can joke about being grumpy, uh, the actual truth is we have a better emotional thermostat the older we get. So a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you is from an excellent book, if you're interested in learning more. It's called The Maturing Mind by uh, Dr. Jean Cohen. So for years, and perhaps some of you also bought into this belief, uh, neuroscientists believed that the brain couldn't grow new brain cells. That in fact, it started decaying after mid-age and sometimes even before that we reached a certain level of intelligence in our 40s and it was downhill the rest of the way. But in 1960, Dr. Joseph Altman did some experiments on rats and he found that they were actually capable of growing new brain cells. This is a, a process called neurogenesis. You may have heard about neurogenesis because it's really revolutionized the way we look at the brain, both for diseased people and for healthy adults. You may also have heard of it as being called neural plasticity. That's the ability for your brain to take off and grow new uh, brain cells and start doing new things. So many regions of the brain contain primitive brain cells that under the right conditions can mature into healthy, fully functioning neurons or glia. Glia cells are the ones that connect other cells and bring the nourishment to the neurons. So they're not actually neurons, but they're uh, building a support system for the uh, neurons. So it's probably no surprise that when they did an autopsy on Albert Einstein, they found that he had an enormous count of glial cells, much more so than the average. We now know that brain cells can form in other important regions of the brain, not just the hippocampus. The hippocampus is in the center of your brain. It's responsible for growing, or sorry, for uh, re forming new memories and also for retrieving those memories. So, most of the new brain growth we find happens in the hippocampus, and in particular, an area called the dentate gyrus. You don't really need to retain that. I just like to throw that out so that when, at the end when I ask you, you'll forget. <laughs> Didn't take gyrus. But that's the physiology, physiology of it is very interesting. They don't know everything yet, but certain factors will stimulate brain growth uh, in the brain. And uh, there's two things in particular I want you to remember. Certain challenging mental activity will stimulate new brain growth. And that's not surprising, really. What has surprised everyone is the second way to grow new brain cells, and that is physical activity. In fact, physical exercise, 20 minutes a day, doesn't have to be rigorous, but you have to get your heart rate up. Let's say walking for 20 minutes, bicycling, playing a sport. That will release certain brain growth uh, chemicals, it seems to provide the juice for building new brain cells. What stops growth and suppresses brain cell production? Two things, prolonged stress. Uh, a little stress is good, it's actually good for building uh, physical cells in your body or mental cells. But over time, if you have too much stress, that growth of new cells in the brain is suppressed. And we find that uh, people who have depression or post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, the hippocampus in the brain is smaller because it just is not active like it should be. But if you treat somebody for depression or PTSD, then that volume, it reverses the trend, so it gets bigger. So prolonged stress is very bad. It's very important that we remain happy. 
And there are lots of fun ways to do this. Uh, it's not like having homework. <laughs> but it should be your goal to have as much fun in your life as possible. Uh, because it will boost your immune system and it will help stimulate brain growth. That's a pretty good prescription for health, isn't it? The physical exercise, I understand, it's a pain in the neck. But it's got to be done. It's got to be done. Only because if you don't, your brain won't grow new cells. And if you have a genetic predisposition for a brain disease in older years, or if you have other physical conditions going on, and you start having signs of dementia or Alzheimer's, if you're not growing new brain cells, you will start showing the symptoms and signs. So that, that's very important to know. What stops brain growth is the stress and too much alcohol and smoking. And that, that, that I think we all know. I don't have to belabor the point. But if you have a brain, it needs oxygen. It needs a lot of nutrients. It needs blueberries. It needs bananas and strawberries. You can't get that if all the blood vessels are constricted because you're smoking. Um, suffice about that. Even a damaged adult brain can regenerate and it can reverse the trend if you treat it right. So the brain's ability to grow new cells is the most exciting discovery in neuroscience that we should all take great comfort from. So when we forget the names of our friends or relatives, <laughs> or we go to the kitchen and then we forget what we're going to do, we, we can get down on ourselves and we beat ourselves up and say, uh-oh, is this signs of early dementia or early Alzheimer's? Well, I say to all that, forget about it, <laughs> which is what you're doing anyway. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why you can forget about being upset about not remembering names. It's true, your processing speed's a little slower as your brain ages, but your memory's fine, it's just you have more stuff in there. You have more knowledge, you have more vocabulary words, you have more names of people. Think of all the people you've met over your lifetime. A lot more than a person of 30 or 40. So what happens is, as we become older, our memory is fine, but our ability to retrieve those names is a little slowed. So the other thing is that as you get older, your brain is more easily distracted. So you lose the ability to focus a little bit. So you go into the kitchen to get something, uh, put something away, and you forget what you were doing. The phone rings, and you start thinking about something else. And before you know it, the next day you're looking for your leftover sandwich. You can't find it, and it's in the dishwasher. You know, OK. <laughs> but it, that is not serious, and it's nothing to worry about. Maybe it's just me. But I've forgiven myself for this. And I keep lots of shopping lists and to do this. Here's another thing I've started doing is I've started tagging names to people. For example, Mark is a remarkable poet. Harriet has great hair. Sharon is always sharing stories. So the man I'm married to is the guy who really stole my heart. His name is Rob. <laughs> now, I just re recently started using this trick, and it really does work. For example, Hector is a heck of a good-looking guy. You, know? you can do this with just about any name, and it does help you remember when, the next time you see them. So you're not really forgetting names. You're just having a hard time retrieving them. Um, I used to hate it when people would say, oh, wait, I'm having a senior moment, you know. Uh, when I was in my 50s, that statement was very funny. Now it's a little too close to home. <laughs> so really, the truth is you have to say, wait, wait, I'm retrieving, I'm retrieving. <laughs> Can I email you next week? <laughs> so what I've done is when I see somebody on the street and I can't quite remember and I can see it on their face. They can't remember me either. I'll say my name right away. I'm Patsy, remember? And they'll usually respond by telling me their name. But there really isn't any shame or any um, social faux pas in not remembering someone's name. 
I want to get to some really good news, because this really, really is good news. It, my face really lit up when I read it. There are many studies that are showing that despite all the losses that we encounter in older age and all the challenges we may have to face, <coughs> seniors have an increasing tendency for a high morale and a positive outlook. That's good news. In other words, and this makes sense, doesn't it? We have a greater acceptance of life's realities. We have a greater sense of ourselves, of our self-worth. We have this long-term perspective that really makes it easier to accept the inevitable things of life. You know, we just don't sweat the small stuff anymore. It truly is the serenity prayer for most of us, and it's working. Part of the reason is that the human emotional responses are produced and regulated in the part of the brain called the limbic system. The limbic system is right in the middle of our brain and it's where our emotions um, are generated and where we remember emotions. And isn't it funny that we can usually remember things that were emotional. If they were just neutral, we don't remember them. This had a very important function in evolution. For example, positive emotions, affection, love, bonding, pleasure, happiness, arise from electrical and chemical impulses, activity in the limbic system in response to an external cues, such as the proximity of a potential mate. We, we get charged up, we can't help ourselves. That's um, in our DNA. If we sense that we're going to have success obtaining food, we get charged up. And we also get charged up when there's a question of status, or success, or some sort of security. The possibility of obtaining satisfaction of higher drives, such as curiosity, or artistic, or musical expression, is very closely related to our emotional centers. On the other hand, we have a negative emotions, and these are true cross-culturally across the globe. Everybody has fear, anger, envy, disgust. Most people have depression. It comes and it goes. Negative emotions arise in response to events that threaten our survival or well-being or our sense of fair play. Now, some negative responses are to things like snakes and spiders. Those are built into our genetic DNA. We can't help ourselves. Or if somebody's being unfair. But anger and fear can also be learned. So in our childhoods and our families, we learn to fear things and we learn anger over things that we spend a lifetime of adult could, trying to get rid of, trying to unlearn some of those fears and negativity. But as we become seniors, our capacity to ride out emotional storms is greatly enhanced. We have more flexibility and more resilience. It seems like our entire system, and in particular the limbic system in our brain, becomes calmer with age. Some of the focus of the research is on the amygdala. There are two almond-shaped uh, organs buried in the limbic system that are responsible for some of our most intense emotions. So activity in the amygdala decreases with age, specifically to negative emotions such as fear and anger and hatred. So what this means, and the studies are incredibly uniform across the board, is that as we age, our brains experience less intense negative emotions we pay less attention to the negative and more to the positive, and we're less likely to remember the negative and favor the positive memories. So older people are calmer in the face of negative emotions. I really noticed that this fact in my own life and with my own friends and in my own marriage. I, and I'm gonna ask you about your experiences with this. For example, my ability to hold my tongue has greatly improved. Uh, I seem to have greater tolerance for other people's idiosyncrasies. It just doesn't bother me as much anymore. And I don't know whether you can say I'm becoming more wise or if you've experienced the same thing, 
but at least there's proof in our brain uh, that this can happen. So I'm going to ask you uh, in general if you've noticed any changes in your moods, one way or the other, negative or positive, have you noticed any changes? Yeah, most of you have. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to share an example of how of the changes you've experienced, the story of... Yes, could we get a microphone over here? We're getting it there. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell your name and your story. Hi, my name is Rosemary. I think one of the most important things, is, especially for older women, not to live in fear. I had a taxi driver steal my billfold. While I was in the taxi, I immediately picked up on it, and he, I pointed at him, and I said, you stole my billfold. With that, I received immense Courage. I went to the Ahihi place, I went to the Chapal place, and I went to the interpreter and spent money on that. Yesterday, it's been six weeks, yesterday a taxi company has come now, and they are getting rid of markets. I think one of the biggest issues that older people do is they give up their personal power. And people said, well, he could have shot you, and I said, I would rather be shot than to give up my personal power. Good for you. Thank you. And I think this is true. A lot of us women aren't powering anymore. We're saying, get off there. You know? The biggest lesson I have learned is forgiveness. Starting with number one. And when I can really forgive myself and love myself, then I can forgive you and I can love you. And so much of the negative just rolls away. And this comes from someone who spent a month in the funny farm as a result of a suicide attempt. And now I know that that is not the right way. That we need to love ourselves. Otherwise, we're not going to do our exercise or do any of the other crap. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> any other stories? What about you men? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let, let's talk a little bit about the differences in the male brain and the female brain because this is kind of interesting, too. Uh, the male and female brains do differ. One of the biggest ways is the difference between the hemispheres in the brain. I think most of you are familiar with the right brain and the left brain. The left brain being where we process language, uh, reading, words, mathematics, sequen sequential thinking. And the right brain is more abstract, artistic, and so forth. And women have uh, neuro more neurons connecting the right and the left, left hemispheres of the brain, which means that, in general, women use both sides of their brains. And men predominantly use one side or the other. The interesting thing is that as we age, we both become more bilateral. What this means is for the old aging brain is that we have more of an ability to access both sides, which is why some, and this has been proposed in many books, that some older people like to write their autobiography. For the first time in their lives, they're able to access the memories, the language, and all the things of the left brain, and the creativeness, and synthesize them, what this all means. So this bilateralization in the brain is another thing they've discovered is happening as our brains age. And they are one of the ways that men and women become more similar in their thinking. So that's very interesting. But there are other ways. Women have more developed language centers in the left hemisphere of the brain, which accounts for the fact that during a day, a man will say approximately 2,000 words. A woman says 7,000 words. That's three and a half times as many. 
Now, my husband will tell you that, that you have to because you, you repeat each other. all the, You repeat yourself all the time. And I tell him, you know, you don't listen the first time, so I have to repeat. <laughs> but nevertheless, women do talk in general. Am I? No. Me? <laughs> okay. Uh, women do use language more. This comes from an evolutionary point of view. Let's look at it this way. Men had to go out and hunt the beasts and kill the beasts. The women were left to tend for the hearth and take care of the kids. Women had to communicate more, and they also had to understand what a, a, a child or a baby was trying to communicate, maybe without the ability of speaking words. For that reason, women have more empathy. They have more what's called mirror neurons in their brains than men do which is, explains it all, doesn't it? <laughs> we women can pick up on things even without language. You men are so focused on killing the gazelle out, out in the plains of Africa that you miss a lot of the emotional cues that we can see. doesn't mean one is better than the other. It means that we have different functions. So. And we have to realize that these differences were for a reason. Our brains really haven't evolved much for 100,000 years. We had the same brains that cavemen had, only we're dealing with different issues like computers instead of gazelles. But uh, we have the same brain functioning. What's interesting is there are, there's a neuroscientist out of Duke University uh, who studied this hemispheric similarity in older brains. Interesting enough, he's um, got a Spanish name. He's Dr. Roberto Cabeza, which I think is a great name for a neuroscientist. <laughs> Cabeza being Spanish for head. And he calls this hemispheric asymmetry reduction in older adults. Hemispheric asymmetry reduction in older adults. H-A-R-O-L-D. Harold. So, this thing called Harold contributes to why older people start using both sides of the brain and start want to do things that they normally wouldn't do, like writing their autobiography. So, here are five things that are new that you could probably make a note on that are different in our brains as we age. As we get older, we have better emotional thermostats in our brain, so we're less likely to get upset and angry, which is really good. We're more tolerant and more forgiving. As we get older, we use more of both sides of our brains. And there's further evidence that in order to stave off um, Alzheimer's and dementia, the more cognitive reserves we have, the better. Cognitive reserve is your body of knowledge, which means that if you were highly educated in your youth, you have a high cognitive reserve. But the good news is you can continue learning and growing that cognitive reserve so that if you do get injury or disease in your brain, it won't show up as much. The other factor that will slow or prevent dementia is exercise, physical exercise. And there's just a lot of research on this. There's no denying it. Uh, they haven't really formulated how many minutes, how many days a week. But the fact is, if you can get your heart rate up for 15, 20 minutes, several times a week, you are priming your brain to learn to grow more nerve cells and to prevent the ravages of older age. Finally, there's a piece of research which is going to be even harder to do than physical exercise. There's more and more research that shows taking in a minimum amount of calories is much better for your brain. They've done studies on animals. They've proven that if an animal eats one-third less calories, it lives one-third longer. They can't really do those experiments on humans, but there are people studying that. So it's not just eating a heart-healthy, low-fat diet. It's eating a minimum amount of calories, not to lose weight, but to live longer. So we're getting out of time. So I just want to... Uh, Excuse me. <clears throat> Summarize some action steps. What can we do? 
Exercise mentally. Learn. Start building your cognitive reserves. <clears throat> Exercise physically. Get out there. Build new brain cells. Explore interesting and challenging activities like hobbies. They can be anything from dancing, board games, uh, crossword puzzles, computer games, it doesn't matter, but get active in something that challenges you and something that interests you. And Lord knows there's so many things here in, in the Chapala area, so many clubs, so many ways to learn new things. The other thing is to achieve some sort of mastery. The sense of control over whatever it is you do will help boost your immune system. So learning a task and learning it well will really make you feel better about yourself. And the last thing, which you all know, is establish strong social networks, which is why organizations like this do so much good. Getting in touch with other people, sharing, talking. It reduces blood pressure, risk of stroke, stress, and loneliness, and grows new brain cells. So each of these activities are important for your brain. Not just one of them, but each of them. There um, are no easy formulas. There are no pills you can take for your brain. These are all lifestyle changes, which is the reason why they're not really funded by the drug companies. Well, the only drug company that's funded anybody to do research is the, can't remember the name of it, but they're doing research on resveratrol, the substance from red wine, because they're trying to develop a pill for it, and they have, they have that pill. Say it again? Reservatrol? It, yeah. So you can get the same effect by eating red grapes. <laughs> yeah, you have to eat thousands of them too. But if you combine that with good exercise and other activities and social networking and, and a, a general healthy lifestyle, you can't go wrong. So I hope this has been helpful for you today. They're learning more every day. There's great books out on it. And I'm going to throw it open to questions. I have a question. Um, a comment first. I'm reading this book called Still Alice. Are you familiar with it? I'm not. I'm okay. It's about a 50-year-old um, uh, linguistics professor at Harvard who has early onset Alzheimer's. And one of the things that she said in this book, or the doctor said, was the only way you could test Alzheimer's was by a biopsy or an autopsy. Is that still true? And the point is, even if you have something like that, there's no treatment except exercise, eating right, learning, social support. So the treatment's the same whether we know for sure you have it or not. Yes, I also read that um, your comment about the older people being more serene and happy also contributes to their being victimized by scammers. Uh, they accept a lot of um, on making money and things of that sort. We've had quite a few of those down here, I'm sorry to say, who have preyed on some of our people here that have lost quite a lot of money. Have you also read that? Or? I haven't read that, but yes, we should pay attention to those things. And that's why a strong social network can really help. Before you invest any money, check it out. Uh, you know, that, that makes sense to me. But yeah, the more optimistic and positive you can, can be, it's true, you might assign those same qualities to somebody else who is not positive and who does not have your best interests at heart. So that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Here, have one here. OK. Could you speak uh, a little bit to some other neurological issues like Parkinson's and things like that? Um, I did mention Parkinson's, but I didn't really mention it much because that's something that can come at any age. And I want to focus on the diseases of the older brain. And certainly, I'm not familiar with the treatments that are being researched for Parkinson's, but, you know, they're working on it, you know. There's, it's unfortunate, you know, it's tragic. And why some people come, come down with these things and others don't is where the research is being held right now. There's one right here. I would like to ask you, you mentioned uh, cigarettes, drugs, and alcohol. 
Um, do you suppose that our society is overmedicated in some way and that causes a lot of brain dysfunction? It's hard for me to address issues of society in general. I do know that doctors want to help people and that their tools in their tool bag are usually pills or surgery. But with the internet nowadays, you can do some of your own research. And with a strong social network, you can reach out to friends and family and find out what other people are doing before taking a medication. The pills can help, and they can harm, and they may be for you or not. And my experience with psychiatrists who prescribe uh, what's called uh, neuro, well, the psychotropic drugs is that they really don't know how it's going to react on you until they give it to you and you come back and tell them. Whether or not that's really a good way to treat people is all we've got for now, except that with brain scans, we're learning more and more every day. And hopefully, we won't have to rely on trial and error much more in the future. I can't address those issues. I'm not a medical doctor or a psychiatrist. I'm a psychologist, so what I'm saying is, what can you do? You know, change the things you can, and one of the several of the things you can change is the exercise, the activity, and your social networking. The pills, see your doctor about it. But like with everything, be cautious. You don't know what kind of reaction you're going to have. Patsy, we're out of time right now. Are you willing to stay after to answer questions when we're done? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so now for a little word about next week. I get to toot my own horn. Uh, next week, we're putting together a program, uh, and we've entitled it, Was the Night Before the World Began, or How Did We End Up Here, or better yet, Where Do We Go, where do we go From Here? And a small group of us who see ourselves as musicians, composers, writers, philosophers, or just some curious folk have put together a musical perspective on how we see life and our intent to create, our intent is to create a playful, boy this is really popping, a playful celebratory uh, experience with a touch of pondering and purpose. Uh, Alan. Vincent, a former Nashville songwriter, singer, who you've heard around town probably, is part of the venue. Charlene Schultz, who is a PhD psychologist, um, who also has a natural singing voice and a great ability to harmonize. Um, Chet Beeswanger, who plays guitar and just fits right into our group. Um, my husband, Todd Miller, uh, who facilitates an eight-year running everyday mindfulness group, and myself, who is part of a, a band in California, Northern California, called Spirit Rising, and we, our intent was to raise your spirit. So hopefully we'll do that next week, and I hope to see you all here then. Uh, and so now, pick up your cups, uh, stack your chairs by color, and thank you for being here today. And if you have questions, ask the folks around.